this is Dr. Kunda Nageshwar, the director of OUCIP. I welcome you all uh, to the online lecture series. As part of the OUCIP lecture series, today we are going to have the tenth lecture. Yeah, uh, it's my proud privilege to invite today's speaker, Professor G. Manoja, Professor, Department of English, Palamur University, Telangana State, Madam is not only a professor of English, but also she works for tribals. She has a close relation with the tribal movements and she has been closely associated with indigenous and tribal movements of Telangana state. Professor G. Manoja has 25 years of research and teaching experience as a translator, as a writer, as the social activist and Professor Manoja Madam worked as the in charge registrar of Palamur University. She worked as the joint director, academic audit cell of Palamur University, Mahabab Nagar, and she worked as the director, PG Center, Palamur University, and she was awarded the meritorious teacher in 2012 by Department of Higher Education, Government of Andhra Pradesh. She has produced three PhD degrees. Uh, currently, six scholars are working under her supervision. Professor G. Manoja has published many articles in the prestigious national and international journals. She works extensively on tribal studies. She has been a resource person and a key keynote speaker in many national and international seminars and conferences. Today, she is going to talk on exploration of indigenous identities and observation. I welcome you, ma'am, to deliver the talk. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for good words. And after particularly this two years stagnation of COVID and all, once again, get into the academic arena. That too, that too, our kind of arena, uh, apart from fieldworks and all, it's good to see you all. In. And it is a good opportunity for me to have a conversation with you all uh, regarding indigenous literatures. Directly coming to my, my talk of this one hour as I am given to, the, I planned it that I'll just touch upon the uh, why indigenous literature is uh, exemplifying only for Native Americans and um, Australian because uh, I hesitate, I hesitate to use the word uh, aboriginals. Uh, really, it is not a proper term. I'll come into it. And Canadian and all. And most of my lecture, I wanted to uh, give it to, to India because this question of indigenous literatures is just a fresh new academic point in our uh, in, in our curriculums. It is yet to enter, not not yet entered actually, and it is yet to enter and more so. I'll just touch upon the worldwide indigenous literatures as such with the due respect to them. But uh, and getting into more than 370 million people across 70 countries, worldwide identity as indigenous. They belong to more than 5,000 different groups and speak more than 4,000 languages. And as per international law, indigenous, the term indigenous acknowledges that a person's ancestors lived in a particular land before new people arrived and became dominant. Indigenous peoples have their own unique customs, their cultures, and often face difficult realities. It is, it is applicable to the world indigenous and anywhere in the world. 
such as having their land taken away and being treated as second class citizens. Very unfortunately, this is the scenario of world indigenous literatures and world indigenous communities. And first of all, I just want to touch upon Native Americans as such. Native American literatures, like any other indigenous and tribal literatures, is not simply a literature, but it is a set of literatures since every tribe has its own cultural traditions. Since 1960s, it has also become a significant field of literary studies. Whereas here I want to mention the thing that any indigenous literary practice would be ages ago, ages back, but they have come into the in, 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 into the uh, into the observation of the uh, academicians like you uh, that it was only in 1960s. It has also become a significant field of literary studies with academic journals and all other uh, paraphernalia of academics. American Indian literary nationalists hold that American Indian literature is best studied through the lens of American Indian cultural and philosophical traditions. Because indigenous literatures are not just literatures. They are, they have many things to go along with them. It is anthropology, it is philosophy, it is of course culture. So they, they just sit with all of them. And here is an observation with Native American literature, it goes like that, particularly the nationalists of the period, they saw that first of these approaches as an attempt to keep Native cultures primarily as an object of Anglo-American study, while the second relied heavily on Euro-Western models and this again served to deprive Native peoples people's legitimate voices. It is uh, particularly when when we try to warn them, when the uh, mainstreams, as we say in India, when my mainstreams wants to touch upon them, the native literatures very much they are, and they are affected particularly, and they lose their own original voices. Uh, here it happens anywhere with these uh, groups actually. Na nationalist criticism, by contrast, would be crucial political issues such as uh, sovereignty of the uh, indigenous people and uh, to, to go along rather than being another ethnic literature within the American canon. They want they want to, it happens in India also. They want to analyze at Native American literatures with the with the American canon, whereas in the American Indian literatures should be seen as the product of separate nations and studied accordingly. Uh, further, when I come to Indian scenario, we need to. I just want to share with the young researchers this. And particularly when we refer in the work of tribal literatures and introduction, author Suzanne Lenquist suggests Native American re Renaissance. It has. Here, it, it is not only Native American, any indigenous community have some common elements as such. They are reclamation of heritage through literary expressions. Discovery and reevaluation of early texts by tribal authors, other indigenous authors, and renewed interest in customary tribal artistic expressions. Here, artistic expressions also include knowledge systems, like uh, just I can't put it as uh, uh, rituals or ceremonies are beyond that. Beyond that, particularly, 
these artistic uh, expressions include the oral traditions and narrative transmissions underline once again i repeat oral traditions and narrative transmissions these are the uh, these are the uh, very fine elements of any indigenous writings as such for, because uh, every for every indigenous group the language is so magical they use it in various various songs and various spells particularly the this language particularly invoke the elements the their prose stories are short tales of their human origins of their heroes are visitations by their gods are their prophecies since language was held in high esteem eloquence was a quality necessary for leadership if you observe when you study about these indigenous literatures wherever the, in the world the characters are very 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 vocal in their character in their nature that, that is and until research times they only elevated language of uh, authorship native rulers in negotiations with the colonial ashrapas because there would be something or other of the uh, protest the protest would be regarded as such and particularly here i want to mention the uh, as uh, we academicians go with the word puritan said that's no uh, i i would be rather very comfortable with the colonial settlers as such they they observed they observed their these uh, indigenous literatures as per their own understanding and they they just documented them in their point of view uh, and they never cared about the original point of view laid under the indigenous literatures <laughs> and Uh, the indigenous people they pass information and legends uh, from generation to generation using ceremonies and performances since they didn't have any written language to document their history it happens everywhere in the world <clears throat> and particularly <laughs> here i want to mention the all the texts here are orally transmitted texts and they link the earth surface people with the plants and animals the rivers and the rocks and all things believed significant in the in the first circle of people though it is not given the character of a dominant genre this is here i want to take your attention also they are indigenous people and indigenous literatures they have their <coughs> their <coughs> direct connection with the <coughs> with the nature and but the dominant literatures dominant criticisms uh, and mainstream criticisms never accepted them as uh, the dominant genre as such it is very very turbulent in the indian situation i come to it later it has a universal appeal the indigenous presentation is an universal appeal because it deals with the universal experience of growing up or coming up of the age the texts relate in native american people to the earth and its life through a spiritual kinship <coughs> in the same way the plant people are also related to indian people so they are known as the <coughs> plant people only and the animal people uh, in in native american languages as such so this quality it was very much found in native american these things and how they were till the date they are 
were in fighting out for their uh, rights. And every tribal literature, every indigenous literature have this shade of uh, <coughs> policy making and politics. This is a very, very turbulent also. And I just want to touch upon a bit of uh, Australian. As I told you, Aboriginal is a very uh, not a proper word as to use for them, but we we are very much tend to use that word. Australians are Aboriginals, as we we we, we refer to them very wrongly. Comprise a heterogeneous set of indigenous people made up of more than 200 language groups. And here, I want to bring to your attention that every individual group have abundance of language groups and the linguistic canons, actually, and they are not. 200 language groups, each characterized by regionally distinct cultural practices. Pan-Aboriginal identification has mobilized a post-colonial politics of writing from an indigenous Australian perspective, one that has been both nationally and transnationally influential. Aboriginal people have been writing since as early their first contact with the European phonographic alphabet. Previous to this, Previous to this European uh, counter, they all Aboriginal, all Australian literature lied in their orality. Today, today the, uh, the book, the very famous book, Black Words, Aboriginal Writers and Storyteller, records more than 5,000 published Aboriginal authors who have produced work in forms of diverse as poetry, plays, short and long prose fiction. Much of this work is imbued with the political charge and aesthetic depth. Here, I want to take up this political charge and unfortunately, very less in Indian indigenous literature, this political tinge is very much discouraged. Uh, writers, they wanted to put it right. So, and non-fiction prose has also been a feature of uh, Australian Ab Aboriginal writing since colonization, covering history, journalism, and some other features as such. And I, I'm not very happy to use this word, but you keep coming uh, into contact when you refer to the Australian uh, Aboriginals that the stolen generations, particularly there, because Australia is believed to be inhabited previously. Uh, afterwards, it was inhabited, and all those stolen generations are mixed of uh, Australian original and white Australian children. They were forcibly removed from their homes and families, according to these people. The notion that the absorbent, absorption or assimilation of some Aboriginal people into the European population is a form of genocide according to the according to the Aboriginal Australians, particularly I remember here Cat Walker uh, and it has gone uh, around academic and leftist political circles long before many, many, many decades ago. Particularly, that's what I was saying, Cat Walker, a, 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 a Aboriginal writer, she turned back from her Catwalker identity to Udgaro Nunukal as such. Nunukal is a, is, a, is a bark leaf where tribes write, and Udgaro, of course, is a uh, tribal surname. So she, she spent her whole life at the, at, the, at, the, at the end of her life cat walker turned back and she could there and uh, i really as i i deal with this paper in our university fourth world literature and i i still remember kim scott particularly he is also the best example fortunately in india we don't come across these uh, cultural assimilations 
uh, uh, in the name of cultural assimilations, the, the atrocities, particularly in these white countries, are very much. So he says, he writes, Kim Scott particularly writes about the exploration of the self-identity, the problem of self-identity, and faced by the light-skinned Aboriginal people and examine the government's assimilistic policies during the first two decades of 20th century. In the process of breeding out the color, this was a process in which children were forcibly removed from their homes and assimilated into the white Australian society. These children were forced to breed breed, I underline here this word, breed with the Australians in order to lessen the appearance of the Aboriginal in them. It was believed that through this continuous process of that eventually there would be no trace of Aboriginal in the future generations. This breeding makes, this breeding kills actually, the, uh, this assimilation kills the original individuals as such, the, and there won't be any Aboriginals in Australia. Finally, it would be white Australians. Luckily, luckily in India, this is not the situation. We are lucky for that. And but and okay, I'll just uh, skip. Australian background as such, and particularly even Canada, as all of us, uh, we know about, because I want to focus my, my own country as such, because in India, we have the very huge gulf of halves, two halves, rather more than, more than two, there are gaps and gaps and gaps in Indian societies. The, the rich cultural heritage, what we speak about very proudly, it has very, very gray shades into it. Those gray shades are never been taken into the academic discussions. We still are, could not put up our indigenous literatures, whether they are subaltern, whether they are downtrodden, whether, whether they are native, what are, what are they? Gayatri Spivak herself said, subaltern can speak. After can the subaltern speak, she herself said, subaltern would speak. But Indian societies, Indian in Indian societies, Indian academia, Indian universities, Indian curriculums still still have their own kind of uh, uh, I don't say confusions. They they are not giving their acknowledgement. They are their acknowledgement to them particularly because here. First of all, I would I would just touch upon. We have caste caste system. Though from ages we fought for a casteless society, by this time Indian circles, when we are heading towards a religious state, particularly caste is a minor thing. When we are so, but here in in this short span of time, I would like to bring bring towards you, bring to your notice particularly to th those sections, the two sections, the old India, the old Sanskrit term said Margi Desi. The English academicians, they said marginalized and mainstream, whatever be, there are these two opposites. There are these two 
islands islands existing in one society Ex it uh, where when people say unity in diversity diversity should be highlighted university could be up we can leave it to the politicians it is a uh, diversity but it is a very positive kind of uh, diversity which we could not explore the uh, indian academicians they tried upon me there are some few names ramanika gupta who um, she she worked very extensively for uh, the tribal groups in india and mahashweta devi of course a non tribal non tribal author but dedicated to the tribal communities santals particularly they dedicate of course there are some people related to ngos and all uh, we can we can open google and we can uh, get anywhere but i very much interested to put forth before the end researchers please with a note make a note with these two sections that there are so many instances in literary history of india that there are so many angles which are neglected totally the abundant literary history was not even touched upon by the historians as i was saying the caste the caste had much rich cultural artistic abundant heritage it was looked upon just a caste by all the groups be the left be the right all the groups they always abandoned caste with a socio political economic economic kind of bends with their ideology nobody ever wanted to touch upon the literature the art in the in the indigenous literatures in the folk the folk once again is a loser term unfortunately loosely translated from the regional languages of india and put into uh, uh, into english particularly the the word folk used in english is very different what we use in indian circumstances it is indigenous actually it is uh, with those uh, communities which are at the lower strata of the indian societies it was always neglected and we live in such a society where the where these hitherto unraveled areas to be taken out and to be put into the researches from so many centuries literature is broadly divided as i was just discussing the mainstreams and the subalterns are uh, um, say marginalities whatever there are two halves two groups here i want to mention the other kind of uh, 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 not exactly segregation uh, other kind of the uh, segment that is the written and oral literary traditions represented by divergent social groups and are divided accordingly in fact these two traditions oral and written needed to flourish simultaneously on uh, parallel grounds unfortunately literary history recorded only those works in the written tradition and uh, the uh, the mainstream literatures particularly and those literatures for from the other sections of the society that is the subaltern section the other section of the society remained in exile they are just labeled as what what can you travel the down to uh, some 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 uh, labels are very very derogating to use for our own selves particularly and and a subaltern section becomes rare that they have put some of their literature in the written tradition and particularly here i want to focus particularly in our area that is in telangana particularly or you can take the undivided andhra pradesh 
people won't accept the tradition written tradition prevailed prevail in these sections of society in the in the neglected sections of the society they thought them illiterate it is a very once again loose term they are they thought them they are unlettered unlettered i think it is a very respect but they wrote their own rights cultural rights they wrote about their own literatures they have their written tradition when asked the older sections and 60 and before that some 25 years ago 20 years ago when i used to ask those 20 years old persons when you could write and uh, write why don't you why don't you tell it outside they are very secretive and seductious because they know if they are enthusiastic enough their literatures could even be suppressed they never wanted to they were, wanted to happen to them this is not recorded anywhere they i have some recordings they tell that why why amma why should we tell so some white collared person would take and sell it write it on his own name so they put they they could write their they have their own written traditions and when we try try to find these literatures then only one can able to understand the rich cultural patterns of their lifestyles these literatures refle reflected the subalternate cultures very effectively their lifestyles songs and plays their language and the, and they all of them they were mer merged into these writings in parallel lines the crux of the indigenous literature was embedded in their themes language language and use of figures of speech of their own they have very effective kind of indigenous writings are very effective kind of uh, expression particularly it is not only knowledge system even the artistic expression is very strong when i come to the tribal sections i could just give it them and it if made a strong stand for uh, these literatures to strong very strongly they they stand by the people's traditions it is not any time the ruler's traditions as such with all the oddities these literatures particularly in india the indigenous literatures they stand by people and they are they could be known as people's literatures praja sahitya as we call in telugu and th this dividing line between the stately literatures and the kingly literatures and the people's literature is uh, very very wide and the two sections are uh, were not interested to know about each other or oral literatures of indigenous societies remained untouched oral literatures very less but once again with the with the with the developing Imagine. attitudes uh, with the globalized attitudes they are once again um, the capitalist attitudes and the uh, and, and the mainstream attitudes the curbing of these oral traditions is coming up in a new era first of all they disguise themselves the capitalists the globalists they disguise themselves as the as the literarians as the academicians as the concierges at least because they have money they are, and they are as uh, just talking upon aesthetics they would they would just uh, try of these uh, oral traditions from from the indigenous people oral literature of folk societies remained untouched the written tradition which recorded the petty details of the kingly states are uh, very much uh, dumb and unacknowledged uh, oral traditions which are about the protests and the songs of the wailer of the people in orality and merely remembered as unimportant because the observations in the in the mouth of 21st century now 
they are very different from when we started up this work as such because the very uh, it is not only um, spreading the gap very very large it is also the capitalistic forces are disguising themselves very very highly and previously at least we could when we are talking about the native american uh, literatures aboriginal literatures canadian literatures they the government is doing the assimilation the government is doing cultural appropriation it was over it was open but unfortunately here in india now it is not open but it is happening but it, um, i i really it is an academic dance i don't want to get into the other things but it is very much uh, very much depressing to know about all these shapes and the these are the reasons as i am uh, i'm telling there are many reasons as such that history which focuses only on the greatness of single individual could not be could not be in a way to speak about the people as such cultural of oppression did not allow these sections whether they are dalits whether they are tribes they it never this culture this mainstream culture never allowed them to just take up and uh, the caste rules to come light into light as sub caste largely depended upon their pattern class here i i must give i think a, a an explanation of this every caste as it sub caste in india so new generations might not be knowing but it is a truth every tribal sect s e c t every tribal sect has some subsects i i just move into the future section of my uh, talk and we'll go to that as sub caste largely depended upon their pattern caste to sing and to propagate about their lifestyles were made nomadic and semi nomadic nomadic is uh, roaming because most of the most of the <coughs> tribes and the uh, most of the uh, what do you say the subaltern sections of the indian societies they are nomadic in nature and they are semi nomadic in nature they would be wandering they would be roaming from one place to another place in search of food in search of their livelihood the and so i am not getting into other details of uh, economy and politics because they don't have the aadhar cards they don't have the ration cards they don't have any measure to their livelihood and particularly even though some of them had permanent uh, inhabitant sources their performances of caste art forms made them semi nomadic in their ways of life their art and performances are highly based on work culture this nature of work majorly represented in indian culture and here as most of my younger colleagues i never want uh, here to be ashamed of this stuff like gray gray zone is part of life and i have many examples to quote that these gray zones could be taken very positively and they could be nullified they could be nulled upon as such if one has to understand the focal points of indian culture they have to understand this culture prominently based on hard physical words then it changes integrated meaning and definition of indian culture and heritage these are not the political culture and heritage this culture is indian indian lower strata of culture and heritage where the mainstream where all other elite sections are making a an unacknowledgement very very suppressing unacknowledgement they won't say good they won't say bad but 
they did not acknowledge these things. They deny, they deny that these are parts of Indian society, without which Indian society could not be a full-fledged society as such. Mostly, every caste who owns a subcaste and every subcaste owns an art form. This never happens, not even in Canadian tribals and not even in... Uh, they have, on the whole, on the whole, they have their rituals, their uh, songs and all, other side in, in world literatures as such. But in India, every subcaste, yes, the, this, uh, I want your, uh, your attention to this. Every tribe and every folk, uh, most of them, they have this uh, art form related to literature. I want your attention here. Those sections of society understood by you learned people, you educated people, you lettered people, that as uneducated people, they have they have one art form. Art is not easy. One art form and it is related with literature in the form either of a mythological story. Uh, here, uh, I want to tell you, it is not the mainstream mythology. In some mythologies, Bhim is the uh, main protagonist. Somewhere, Ravan is the main protagonist. So, these are... The, there are 300 Ramayanas, as a, uh, A.K. Ramanujan says. There are, there are 300 Ramayanas in, in Indian societies. We stick on only to one Sri Ram. Now, it is, anyway, it is not. So, I want your, your focus on the, at the focal point, it is art form, and there are tribal and folk and others. First of all, there would be a text or narration and with a recited or singer. Here, I want to tell you, uh, if, if you, most of you might be from this place, Hyderabad. And so here, I, uh, um, let me give you the famous uh, fairy Jatra of Sammakasar. We'll take, for, for this chart, we take the example of that. I, I don't want to get into the epics as such. I want to get into the Samakasaraka, very, uh, very valorous woman who fought against the Kakatiya dynasty and the King Pratap. In this narration, let me tell you the balladies are dolis. They are subsect to Koya, Koyatur sect of people. They are, they live in, I think I, uh, they, they live in the district of Kamam and um, Kamam and Varangal border districts. There is only one person, Ramalu is uh, living, all others are, they, they are no more now, they died. Thus, that person, he sings this text narration. It continues for seven long days, and that narration is, uh, as uh, you like people call him, is an illiterate person, uneducated person. But that very uneducated person, illiterate person, he has this long narrative. He recites, he sings for seven long days. Here, the students to whom we teach, they could not remember 30 pages material for one examination. As teachers, we fail to make them to make them just uh, uh, write it back. But this Dolis, Koya people, they remember. And then I come to this performance. This performance feature, I would like to mention our own uh, people that Jamapurana by Ma, 
I, I, these are not cars I am mentioning here. These are the very respectful social groups, social community groups where rich, rich artistic traditions, knowledge systems are hidden. Performance is not easy. Dialogue delivery is not easy. Acting is not easy. They sing and they perform at one place. They, their, their, their Ramulu, uh, his leg, his anklet, his tongue, his hand, and his kinnel. So musical instruments, you won't get them in your avid Scotty shops. What? Oh. He he makes the tribe the tribe are the folk are the indigenous community. They make their own musical instruments. It is very tough to make in the in the current situations. So this is the only chart that will give you the glimpse of Indian Indian appraised Balkan indigenous scenarios. Because every time I talk about, I feel very emotional about it and very, very shameful about the callousness we, uh, we show towards these literatures. And of course, they have their own attire also. And particularly for each musical instrument they have. It is. It, um, they don't have any fashion designers actually, but they do have their attires. When when they are singing Samakasarata ballet, they they wear a particular kind of uh, attire with dhoti and waistcoat and a turban as such. When they see they play an runja, such a uh, a folk uh, this thing, they have a bare chested. Uh, bare chested, uh, a simple pink colored dhoti as such. All, all of them, they are in these sections. And particularly the John of uh, these uh, texts and narratives. When uh, narrations comes, let me tell you, all these uh, Indians, they are inviterate storytellers. Every Indian. Usually I speak it to we women, every woman is a storyteller, but uh, uh, speaking the truth, every Indian is a good storyteller, but unfortunately, very little has been written or mentioned about the narrative discourse of India. Unfortunately, we think that narratology has, we borrowed it from West. Ayapa uh, Panikar, he wrote the one and single pioneering book, but we never wanted to acknowledge it and that these narrative discourses we always owe something to something to west but it is uh, the these narrative discourses are very prominent in india but the art of the narrative was cultivated very vigorously and assiduously in our communities particularly in telangana traditional indian techniques have surfaced in experimental western theater this is what i am coming here what i was uh, uh, talking about the text narration uh, singing performing all put it together it, it might be jamba purana with a patam the big visual aid the painting these sections particularly what we thought the indigenous sections the subaltern sections the um, base sections of the society they have a big paraphernalia around them. They have painting, they have music, they have puppetry, what not. They have all those things. Just those things are not surfaced. All fiction is a mental construction. For them, for tribes, for indigenous people, for folk communities, for this, uh, all, all the... All the uh, Chin, Chindu communities, for Nukalachandaya communities, all of uh, all these uh, stories, all these narratives are mental constructions. They know that art of narration is an attempt to construct in accordance with the narrative style. May it be clown, vidushak, 
may it be everywhere and particularly here i want your attention because it might be a new area to most of you it is not we read breast the breast theater or shakespearean theater or say the the the, the senecan theater it is it develops then and there the baladi the performer just walks into the walks into the uh, walks into the audience pick up something and very spontaneously extemporally he look the part look the collector sir has joined look it is not written anywhere and for the delhi amateur artists you have to prompt them but our our people never want any promptness that spontaneousness is always in them they could they could develop the story into the story they develop and they perform the placement of a single story in a chain of stories this is what shakespeare did in his uh, hamlet or uh, hamlet particularly how, how i remember and i am very sorry to 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 to, to indigenous literatures to club them with the shakespeare's and brish and all because this is such a unique uh, theater that it doesn't uh, need any similarities as such and the placement of a single story in a chain of stories is a very natural form of narrative art as india represents a mosaic of cultures a rich and variegated civilizations this plurality of the cultural matrix requires an elasticity and adjustable text the indian narratives has uh, infinite variants in each regional language and each cultural unit so these are here particularly we are talking about chindu dakali jambu puranas particularly we are talking about uh, when the one chapter of jambu purana when translated for the rootage i remember i, I remember the very very positive response of those sections till now but it is an really a very cunning silence of our own academic circles that it could not be so johns they are puranas ballads stories heroic verses there is religion and unfortunately here i have to come to this point also uh everything that is touched up as they are painting jambu purana's visual aid patam it is given just a stroke of religion the society cunningly made it religious there every mainstream ritual is questioned it was not any time studied it was any time not asked for the revelation but it is always just dumped upon that all indian narratives are religious it is a wrong misconception very wrong misconception there the first clown he as a mainstream character to for his own identity it was received it was cherished and no dakali never ever accepted to give this right to any mainstream section any elite section he always found and these uh, cultural subcast particularly these because unfortunately in uh, telangana and ap particularly culture is not received by the left connotations as we go get into the post modernistic to the marxistic and all of this culture was not uh, really misunderstood there and uh, once again culture was misunderstood by uh, themes here uh, he particularly getting deep into these variations that's what indian criticism indian literary criticism 
just touched upon the mainstream criticism only with the Devi, uh, Ganesh Devi. Of course, he deals with the uh, tribal literatures and tribal tribal literatures, but criticisms could not be propped up any time, could not be come up any time, could not be really flourish any time because we are ashrapped, we are oppressed because for the indigenous, for the section of these sections of society, particularly, it was double-edged, multi-layered suppression. One side, the mainstream cultures within India, the elite cultures within India, they suppressed and from outside, the missionary and the uh, and the uh, colonial West cultures, and particularly founding, farming our own uh, literary uh, analysis, actually critical analysis. Unfortunately, still till now, we look into all these tribal indigenous literature in the viewpoint of uh, Western theories. Take up some Marxist theory, take up some reader's response theory, take up new... They were born, they were born, these criticisms were born very, very, very ages before when, when, when all these uh, new criticisms and all they had propounded. Unfortunately, we could not uh, we could not have a, any kind of a critical analysis for our own literatures and we are wrongly uh, putting them into the mouths of western theories taking the indigenous indian tribal theory indian uh, sub, uh, sub section theory indian uh, indigenous communities theory taking a sub-anda, what I mean to say is uh, taking it into the Western outlook, they could never ever understand. The religion was miscalculated, misinterpreted, and even the critical analysis also. For example, just very, very shortly, I, I, I'll just uh, make an observation that were, were just uh, rewriting. We call it in Telugu a tirai. They are these are these are the some of the some of the tribal alphabet and tribal writings as such. Here I just wanted to mention all the researchers that they are they are similar to John Milton's Saturn. Some of the characters in that. So uh, what? these literatures the very rich and abundant as i'm running out of time i must conclude properly so all all these literatures particularly they they want they should be they should get their own their own kind of place in in main mainstream literatures for example let me conclude let me conclude with one observation as it is for that there are in mainstream there's in mainstream languages in india there are only 26 languages and in in, in indian tribal indigenous groups there are 900 900 variants and 90 languages particularly which are dying very fast and we are very calm observing them to die. And we are, uh, uh, there are many political activities, but regarding literature and criticism, this is high time for the researchers to take up uh, studies regarding these things. And there is m abundancy of research capability into these areas. There are more than 90 languages to be to come up and there are <coughs> more other things as I was selling <coughs> there are 
there are many many ways many surreptitious ways in our societies they don't talk about them they have their own knowledge systems they have mirasi rights we know about the mirasi rights as only the land rights but they are artistic rights they are there there are with many many things now many archival archival patterns are there archival materials are there they are directly related to the indian knowledge systems indian art expressions indian art expressions are hitherto borrowed from so many years but it is time to develop those art expressions excluding the very connotated i quote and i unquote expressions there need to be very true indian kind of literary expressions and there should not there are many ways if you if we get into those knowledge systems and those expressions so i request all the researchers who are that side to just give a not a look a deep deep study into our own societies thank you very much thank you thank very you much ma'am for your wonderful presentation and uh, uh, it is the time to uh, say formal word of thanks uh, to the lecture uh, really you have presented you have made the lecture very easy and presented the things in a lucid manner you have started the discussion from the beginning and you have taken us to the each and every part of the world and india and with you, with the, your rich experience and you have done a wonderful presentation madam on behalf of the oucat and my heart felt gratitude to you i am very thankful to you for sparing your valuable time and uh, presenting your valuable thoughts with the uh, uh, delegates and the teachers scholars uh, participants from various parts of the country thank you very much ma'am for your wonderful and live time thank you all and next tuesday we will have the other lecture and the lecture will be sent to your mail thank you one and all for taking an active part in the lecture series and a special thanks to mr shamil technical coordinator of oucat thank you thank you thank all. you namaste